Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. This is Walt with the Sales Startups and Side Hustles podcast. We have an incredible special guest on our show today. Someone who grew up in Dublin, Ireland, has then gone on to live on multiple continents across the planet and has been in sales and leading sales teams for more than 30 years. She has created incredible results working with companies like Harrods of London, working with David Jones here in Australia, and has now gone on to publish her first book, which is called Finding Your your true north or finding your uh, your north star uh, published last year and available on Amazon. She is an incredible uh, sales mentor and she is now the managing director of her own uh, sales training organization, which is uh, Coaching with Jane. I think I've got that right. Jane Hernan is her name and she is our sales superstar joining us this morning. Jane, thank you so much for jumping on the show. Now, I'm looking at your history. I'm seeing your incredible range of results that you've been able to achieve. You jump straight out of college, straight out of school and into the retail sales environment. Welcome to the show and tell us how did this all get started for you? So I would say that, so first of all, I'm delighted to be on your show, Walt. Thanks very much for having me and greetings to everyone from Dublin. So I'd say that I possibly wasn't the most academic person. I was always a doer rather than burying my head in books. So from that end, I was never destined to go and do a degree in college. I just wanted to hit the ground running, try and find something that I loved. And purely by accident, I actually got into sales and that was pharmacy sales, just locally. I was only 17 at the time. So I, I suppose from that, I, I became very good very quickly. And I suppose what is missing in a little bit today that we find there's not an awful lot of sales training. And in those days, we were trained how to sell. Mm. So we would have training sessions first thing in the morning and Saturday mornings we'd come in early. Um, John Cleese actually was wow. one of our, not, not in person. He had made a series and they're still available if you go hunting for them. But they were incredible how to deal with the tricky customer. Um, just how to close sales, how to re be respectful. So there was actual proper training, which I find nowadays is really lacking. So a lot of people come into these roles, they might love furniture, they might love the pharmacy end, they might love the new products, but they don't really know how to sell. Mm. And they don't really know how to close that sale. And particularly in B2B, that is vital because it's all about the building relationships, um, the rapport, finding that pain that somebody is finding it difficult to, to bridge a gap. Um, and there's a lot of competition out there. So you need to really know your customer very well and help them through that process. Absolutely. So if I backpedal a little bit, I... Didn't spend too long in Dublin. I'd say I was 19, 20 when I left and I went to London. So I did beauty therapy course and I did the international, the Sodesco. So anyone in that end would know that particular qualification, which gives you a diploma really to work anywhere in the world. So you have sales, you have all your beauty, you have your cosmetics, everything, all that training background. So I did that in Baker Street in London. And then I stayed there for a few years. I'd say I stayed for about five years in London, working in Harrods, working in Selfridges. So there's nothing like being on a big team, but I was the junior on a big team. Amazing. And it's fantastic and it's fascinating. And you can imagine in such a huge store with massive footfall, how busy we were all the time, how exhausting it was. So I suppose the one thing that I did learn from very early on, first of all, it's the importance of getting on with your team, mm. the importance of being equal. And we had a super manager of I think there was about 15 of us on that team so that's a very big sales team in a very small area and she was just incredible she was Australian actually she was a super girl but she you would not have known had you come to the counter to buy products you would not have known who was the real boss you would not know she just treated us all really equally and from a perspective, there wasn't that boss and team element. And that is the big secret. It's wow. like being the servant boss. 
that is, is that, the way to do it. Is that something that you've that carried is, forward? Like, I mean, you, you absolutely. Grew to, the, to the manager in that role, and was she your mentor? There moving she was the my mentor. So I had I was very lucky from very early on. Now I had some difficult people later on, which is also good to learn from because you have to grow a little bit of a thick skin. And in a lot of ways with sales, you are acting. You really have to think on your feet. You're improvising constantly. So if you have a bad day at home, if you if things aren't great, you have to bring in your good face to work. Yeah. Because you're dealing with you know, people are coming to you for help, for solutions. That's what sales is all about. So being on a big team where we were all very equal, she was very fair. Everyone got listened to. And the real secret too, she got to know us all personally. So she would take us for a coffee. She would. So basically she was holding your hand, getting you through situations, anything, any problems that we were having, because you'd always find, look, one person may not be pulling their weight. You happen to be going to the stock room and doing de the deliveries when they come in and trying to sort customers out. And a lot of people on teams like that, you'll find that half them pull their weight far more than yeah. others will. And so, others are coasting through. Amazing. Exactly. And others must, will just do. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It must have been an amazing feeling to have, you know, the hallowed halls of Harrods around you and Selfridges as well. And, and, and generating that incredible teamwork um, within those, that amazing environment. And I, I guess um, being only uh, a fan, a shopper, a, a retail person, customer coming into Harrods, I see the, the glamour, I see the, uh, the, the amazing uh, energy that's within the, that environment, but there must've been just a massive amount of work to do every single day for, for so many people coming through those doors. It was. And we would have to have little meetings every morning and different jobs were allocated to different people. Mm. So we would all be on a rota, for want of a better word. It was it's like running a household. Yeah. You have to get the chores done. So therefore, we all need to share them out. Um, so, yeah, an awful lot to do because we were also a skincare company. So we were also offering facials in the back. So you're in a quite a confined space. Um, and the footfall through these stores is just enormous. Yeah. So you're always on. You don't have time to kind of slump and Put say, your feet up and have a cup oh, of tea. Never, no, never get that chance. No, 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 no. So there was no, not that chance at all. So yes, Amazing. fantastic experience. Now, you mentioned just before we clicked on the record button that um, that you are intensely competitive, which I absolutely love. Was there was there a, a a daily set that you had to reach? Was there a target for the team? Was it something that you were constantly aware of and constantly pushing for? Yes. So we would analyze our our achievements from the week before. Mm -hmm. um, it depended on the time of the year, but some we would be on promotion maybe three to four times in that year. So that would be gift with purchase. So our budgets would be enormous for that. You can imagine in a store like Harrods where your footfall would be 200,000 a day perhaps wow. through the store. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to get out there and and attract that. So obviously you'd have merchandising and you'd have everything else and there'd be somebody in charge of that. Um, but you would also, you need to have written to your own customers. We'd all have our own specific customers as well that would come to us. So the other amazing thing that I found too in, in basic training is that when someone comes to you and they're looking for whatever product it is, so it doesn't matter whether you're selling cutlery, face cream, uh, soft furnishings, always give them what they're looking for. So if the lady wants her eye cream or a lipstick, always put that in front of them first mm. and then do your link selling. Where a lot of people go, they're looking, they're analyzing the lady maybe in front of them or thinking, well, actually, we've got this new product and I want to push that because that's where I'm going to get my bonus from. Uh -uh. Always give the customer what they want, what do they ask for, first of all, because otherwise they're never really going to be satisfied long term. They came in looking for a certain thing, give it to them and then link sell and start from there. link sell around that. In, in my sales, in my sales career, I've, I've always been told that the customer, uh, clearly the customer is always right, but, um, Sometimes they don't know what they need. And especially as you're moving from that retail environment into B2B and, and where your focus is now, I know with, with your coaching business, you, you're talking very much to uh, companies about finding their, finding their sales feed and training their sales teams and, and creating all of that. Um, do you ever find the case where 
you don't really know or understand what the customer is looking for. They come to you with a problem, but they don't know they their don't solution. Know you have to design that with them. Absolutely. I'd say eight out of 10 customers are that customer. Mm. Um, and so no matter what it is, whether it's components for an engineering company, as I was saying, or it's it's cosmetics or soft furnishing or whatever line you're in, pharmacy end, at the end of the day, the customer will come to you for one specific reason. They've either heard that you're very good, that your product's very good, or that you look after the customer well, or else they're just testing to see. Because in the end of the day now, people can just really look things up and go anywhere. Mm. So when you have that attention in front of you, and if someone is actually coming to you, that is gold. So you don't have to go out looking for that business. They have come to you. So if so, it's up to you to build the rapport and you make it all about them, not about what you are going to do for them. You need to delve deep and just get to know that customer. And sometimes that can take a couple of touches. It's not that's not going to happen on the first go. So you've made the connection, then you do another follow up and you've maybe gone away and done some research for them with the company that is supplying you so that you can go back and give them even more information and see if that's going to help them solve their issue. So it's all about building the relationship, getting to know the customer really well, getting to know their needs and seeing how you're going to be able to slot in there and long term. It's not just for now. So in the future, will you be able to link something else that's going to to add on to that? And so you, you're building the rapport, building the relationship, and it's kind of like a friendship. Mm. So it doesn't become about the product really until later. Yeah, right. Until so you, you could have had about, Yes, you could have had about three touches or three situations where you've had contact with them before you even get down to that. Absolutely. So make it all about them. It's not about you and how you're going to. It's about them. Find out what they need, what their pain point is, what solutions they need. Sometimes, as I say, in some cases, you've got to go away and try and find solutions for them and come back then. Definitely. So it's it, it's about the service and feeling, making them feel really good that you're really looking after them. Amazing. Amazing. Is it something that's teachable? Do you think, Jane? Do you think, uh, do you think um, I meet a lot of business owners who, who are incredible at what they've created? They've created something special in the marketplace. And then they'll turn around to me and they'll say something like, um, oh, but I just, I'm just not good at sales. Is it something that anybody can learn, do you feel? Yes. I Is think it it's very teachable. I think some people are just born, but, uh, born salespeople, but I think you've got to have a passion for helping people mm. because- I think if you make it about the money or the product, I think you're missing the point. I think look after your customer and the money will look after itself. So there's a lot of companies out there that have great products. And yes, your product is great and it's unique and it's fantastic and it's marketed beautifully and packaged beautifully, but they can really get that same product that's going to do the same thing for them. You've got to sell those benefits and it's really selling you. And a lot of people miss that point. It's you. So I have this little joke with some of the girls that I train. And I say that I always need to have a good pair of glasses on because this is my truth. I want you to connect with me and make eye contact with me. So it's it, the eye contact and the relationship and how you are with people physically. A lot of it is body language as well. So it's not just about what you're showing them or how you're showing them. It's about you selling yourself to them. Amazing. It's buying the, their trust. Amazing. So, so for me, the eyes are very important that I have my eyes on my little bit of eye makeup or whatever. And the glasses are great because it, I have to wear them anyway. It's, now it's your lens. You, you get to, yes. you get to switch on and, and turn that yes. into, that's your on mode. It's my on mode, but it also can become a little bit of a barrier breakdown because you're okay. chatting about the glasses and you're getting to know people and, you know, so it's all part of the chit chat. 
I did. I did so, notice when we came on, um, and for those of you who are watching this on the video replay, Jane's uh, Jane's glasses there are amazing. For those who are on audio, where well, are you missing out? Come on over to the YouTube channel and check it out and uh, and see what we've got there. So, Jane, I think it, you obviously come across incredibly warmly. You have an instant ability to connect with people. Was it always that way for you? Did you you said you accidentally found yourself in sales, as so many people who who wind up amazing at sales do? Um, did you always have that natural connection with people, or was that something that you learned as well? Um. I would say, I, I guess, that I always loved people and mm. certainly I was never shy or lacking in confidence. But you never know how good you are at something until you try it. And really, I suppose if I'd been given an option, I possibly wouldn't have gone down the road of sales at all. Um, I really wanted to do interior design early on and I ended up not doing that. I think the other career path I would have gone down was physiotherapy but That's it, a big change. It, you have to, yes that was my very first choice which would have been I think not wrong for me because you're still very much helping people and I think I have that in me I just love to see people being able to get up and go so whether that's physically or in themselves or achieve something or help other people that for me is is just great it's not about the money it's about helping people and seeing them succeed. So that was my first, but I didn't get the exam. I didn't get the exam to get into college. So life took me down a different route. And in those days, I wouldn't have had as much choice as young people nowadays. There's a lot of different routes you can go to get to your end goal. So, as I say, I took that lovely job in the local pharmacy and it grew legs then. I just really became very good at what I was doing. They gave me all the cosmetic section to look after. That grew very quickly. Then, of course, when you're when you're that good, that young, you, you want to leave and see what else you can do. So I ended up doing the beauty therapy in London, ended up working in Harrods and Selfridges, and that was just fantastic. And I suppose another little point I want to make is the culture on teams is so important. So how because, does somebody develop that? Well, I think there can be there can be no backstabbing. Mm. There can be no meanness about anybody. I think if you have gripes with people, it needs to be said because you've got to work together and it comes from the top. And as I said, I had that lovely Australian leader at the time of our team. She was just so perceptive. And there were quite a few young girls. She was in her mid 30s at the time. So she had the experience with working with people. And I suppose. Not allowing badness creep in mm. and, and being fair to people. So not like making people stay on the counter when you know they've a headache or you know there's a gripe with somebody else. Just go. We'll manage fine. Don't worry. You're part of our team. It's important that you get well and come back. Whatever it is, there's fairness and everyone feels equal. So there's all, there was also a lot of different cultures working there, a lot of different nationalities foreign languages. So we all had to be very patient with each other. Um, and everyone has their strengths and everyone has their weaknesses. So if you know that Mary Jane next door to you isn't hectic at one side of things or she feels that you feel that maybe that she has a tricky customer that you could handle better, you can step in and help her there because nice. you know that she's going to help you back. So it's, it, it's again about genuine care and about making sure that that people are treated as um, people rather than just uh, employees or as in numbers. So how did that lead you to Australia, Jane? That's a that's an amazing, um, amazing jump. I did that in reverse. I went from Australia to London, which uh, which was amazing for me. But how how did that come to you in, in your world going from uh, Harrods and Suffrages over to the Australian shores? So I would say that. A lot of my age group at the time were in New York or Boston. That mm. was the place to go. And I think it was oversaturated. And I was working with a few girls in London that were Australian. So that was the attraction for me. And they they weren't necessarily there. They hadn't gone home. But I'd heard so many good things that I ended up going to live in Sydney. And I spent two and a half years there. And I'd say they were possibly the 
two and a half years, best two and a half years of my life. You loved I it. I absolutely yeah. adored it. I'll, I don't know. I'll tell you in a minute why I came back. But out of that time too, I spent six months of that in New Zealand and did some traveling. But I was always based. I lived in Cremorne in Sydney. I just lovely area, lovely city. It was just the freedom, the climate, the people. It was just ticking all my boxes after wet, stressful London and Dublin. Right. So it was so just what? a lovely change when I was young and free, you know, so it was just Something great. brought you back then. I mean, uh, you speak about it so fondly, which is lovely, but something brought you back. What What was it that, that, uh, that tripped the switch and sent you back uh, all that way? I'll tell you why. I suppose... I was I had actually applied for residency in mm -hmm. Sydney and in those days you had to live there for at least two years um, when you had applied. So I was already there two years. I hadn't seen my family in those days. People weren't traveling as often. It was the very early 1990s. So that's just telling you my age now, isn't it, too? So I suppose I got a, f a phone call then from a friend to say we have a superb job to head up. Um, a cosmetic agency that has taken over in Ireland and uh, we want you back. We'd love nice. you back for that. Fantastic. And that happened in the March and I came. That's that is why I left and I left very quickly. But saying that I did return this Christmas. I was in Sydney for New Year. I had the best time, but I actually walked down Elizabeth Street and I had tears in my eyes. It, it brought back a lot of emotion for me. Mm. I had some superb friends. It's a fabulous city to live in. It if really was. It was just so free and fantastic. And I met some great people. I'm so glad that you had such a, a, an amazing time there. So as I look at your history, so you've gone, you've, you've taken this amazing leap. You've, you've gone international. You, you're managing a, a, an incredible retail store over here. Um, and then that role that you speak of going back to, uh, to Ireland, as I read this through, was a national role. You were then uh, the area manager for, for a very large cosmetics brand and taking on a national role. So at this point now, your sales skills needs to be translated, not necessarily frontline, I'm guessing. Um, you're now teaching the teams of people around Ireland and helping them to create those same results. So was that a big change for you in terms of what a day looked like? You went from that kind of retail front end to then managing those teams all around the country. Was that something that that uh, really um, took off for you? Was it, was it a love as well, a passion? No, it wasn't. It was actually quite tricky, mm. to be perfectly honest. It, I grew to love it, um, but it became you, you just can't keep doing the same thing all the time, especially when you're young. Sure. You need to sure. just branch out and try some new things. And I think that's the only way you're ever going to grow or know if you're any good at it. But if you don't touch it, you're never going to know. So. When I came back to Ireland, it was actually quite difficult. Um, a lot of my friends had moved on. Uh, I had lived in London before that. And then I went straight from London to Australia. So when I came back here, there was about a five or six year gap. Although I'd kept in touch with people. Remember, this was not the time of the Internet either. So it was, <laughs> we were just on the brink of that then. But um, so times were, were tough for me. People were getting all my friends were getting married, settling down. At this stage, I was coming into my later 20s. Um, so it's not an easy time in anyone's life, too, because it's quite a transitionary time. Mm. Um, but I must say that I really enjoyed it. I went to work for Brown Thomas and from Brown Thomas, Brown Thomas would be the Harrods of Dublin. Um, I looked after the Clinique team in there. So I became that lovely girl that was my original boss in in in, in Selfridges. I became her wow. in, in Brand Thomas. So we had a very big team. Clinique was the skincare cosmetic cosmetic house at the time. It was absolutely enormous and it still is. But at the time it was huge. So um, from there, then I went directly to Guerlain and looked after all the accounts all over Ireland, including Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, as you know. Mm -hmm. So that was very different because what I was really doing was starting to really motivate the teams and seeing the little cracks or where people were really struggling within teams. But I had all that experience then to be able to share that with them. So obviously I wasn't staying with them. I was moving on, but I was making sure that they were 
secure in themselves, that they were able to meet their targets, that they had their stock levels, that there were no customer issues. So there was an awful lot to sort out and then prepare them for when they were doing gift with purchase, because that's kind of high octane right. in, a, in a store situation. Mm-hmm. Everyone needs to be well and on and full throttle for two weeks. That's the big kind of money earner. So looking after, of course, there were lots of issues. There always are lots of issues between stores and the way they want you to manage something, the way they want their stock displayed. And you don't want that because you have certain merchandising. You have all these issues. So the girls were up against a lot of barriers, depending on the policies of the companies. But the same basic issues are always there. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs upskilling. And what I'm finding now is that a lot of managers are coming in with super degrees, great qualifications, but they don't have people skills. And they're going in then and saying, look, this is the way it's going to be. And then others, the the, the sales team or whatever underneath them are kind of going, this isn't how we've been doing it. And suddenly the results aren't as good as they were. And they're wondering why, but it's all to do with the people management. If you don't get it right from the top, nothing is going to operate well for you. I find that fascinating. I, find I, that think, fascinating. I think the um uh the the change in the way that we all communicate these days and and um the the social media, I guess sensation and the the wave that we're all on there has changed that people skills environment. And and again, um same same age group I I grew up where you know finding that connection with with people was something that was a skill that was developed early on. Um. But it's interesting to me now that to understand the 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 people skills, the soft skills of of people to people connection is so important. When you're so, we're going to lead into the fact that you you've now um, from that role you opened your own business. You had that for a few years, and then you know you you've changed and gone back, and now again uh, creating your incredible coaching business that you have now. Um, is this something that you are focused on with your with your clients now? Are you helping them create those? personal connections as the valuable skill? Yes. Mm. So so when they contact me, they usually say, look, we're struggling a little bit. We were doing very well, but we're still doing well, but we're not growing. So that I will automatically know that there's some issue going on there because they've expanded. So they've taken on more people and yet they're taking pretty much the same figures as they were a year ago. So there's something not quite right there. Despite recessions and hard times and all of that, there's a a better spread. So therefore the results should be better. Mm -hmm. So normally when I go in, you will find that the team leader or the manager or the boss would never see that it could be them. Right. They rarely do. They may Mm -hmm. sometimes admit to you, they'll say, it could be me, but I don't know quite why, or I'm having a few issues with this or a few issues with that. And I'll say, look, don't worry, we will get to the bottom of it. So normally I would have a discussion with them, first of all, and that could be over a couple of hours or maybe two or three sessions, and we'll get to the real bottom of where we find that the the problems could be or the issues could be. So then I will go and take the team and that could be over several weeks, maybe six to eight weeks on weekly sessions of about an hour and a half to two hours. And we'll really get down to the nitty gritty and see where they're having issues and where they're having problems. But eight out of 10 times, I would say, that it all comes down to the culture. One feels Mm -hmm. undervalued. They're not being acknowledged. My boss doesn't even know me. I'm having a really tough time at home. Um, But that's it. So the lack of communication, the amount of companies that don't make time per week even to meet as a group is huge. But it's also individually taking those people, even if it's for a coffee for 15 minutes a week, and just just saying, look, they are. Sarah, I'm just checking in with you. John, how are things? How are you finding? Because you learn so much about somebody. And a lot of people will say to me, look, I was employed to actually be in sales, but I'm not in sales. I'm an admin. And I'm Mm. very frustrated. Yeah. But they're afraid. They're afraid to say it in case they're told to get on with it or lose their job or yes, or that they're undervalued or whatever. So there's a lot of... A lot of frustration before you even getting get down to to sales skills per se. Amazing. So, so by the time I get down to 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 doing the upskilling, there's a lot of layers. 
you've got to get that personality connection through first. You've got as you know, first first seek to be to understand, right? Uh, I noticed that you were quoting Stephen Covey um, on some of your work there as well. And uh, first yes. seek first to uh, to understand, then to be understood. Um, I think so. As you've moved through Jane and and now running um, the coaching business that you have, which is uh, JaneHernanCoaching.com, by the way, guys. If you if you'd like to connect with Jane, so it's JaneHernanCoaching.com. We'll make sure that that's in our show notes as well, so you guys can check that out. Um, as you've moved forward then so you've gone from you've gone from falling into sales you've created you've become good at it you've then grown into a, a manager area manager national manager you've traveled internationally um along the way you you did go into that passion of yours which was interior design and I, and I mentioned before we started recording i loved some of the shots that looked absolutely beautiful what what um what skills or what difference did you find going from working in a team to now owning your business and creating your team was there was there a big upskill that you needed to do personally there so being in, in, I suppose it's much more one-on-one -on -one. Mm. and it's, I suppose it's always one-on-one, -on -one, but when you're standing in someone's home, as opposed to standing in the store, which you will also do, I actually am still doing a little bit of that work because one company employs me two days a week. So I do my coaching four days out of, out of the week. I still look after private clients for a local company, cosmetic company, well-known cosmetic company here in Dublin. Um, so I will go to their homes and I'll see what they need, what we need to do. And I think you build a great relationship. It all comes back to the relationships and a great mm. rapport. And it's about trust as well, because as I'd say, I'm not going to give you something that I know isn't going to be right for you. And you wouldn't have come to me if you could do this yourself. So you give them options again. So you're going to give them an option. Look, this is what you can do with what you have at the moment. This is your basic that you could do yourself. No problem. Here's two options pushing your boat out a little bit here. So these are giving you and you can marry that and marry that and marry a little bit of this. But you you have to give people options, give them choices. But it's also saying, trust me because I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this well for you, but I'm going to push your boundaries. Nice. So just have a little bit of faith here. But if someone is going to spend 20,000 euro with you on new sofas, furnishings, new rugs, whatever, they need to know and they need to trust you that mm -hmm. you're going to do a great job for them. Yeah. So again, it's about the relationships. It's about getting to know people. Did their cat go to the vet last week? Just follow up on that. A lot of people have elderly parents now that are still well alive into their 80s and 90s, not like our parents' generation who didn't really have that. So a lot of them are in sandwich generation. They've got people in their early 20s living at home still with them in college and they're looking after. So you've got all that bridging going on and homes have to be created to accommodate, uh, to, to accommodate all that. Yeah. So. It's just about having a good memory about the person that's standing in front of you. It's also about when you get into that creative zone that you are thinking about them and their lifestyle. It, everything in sales comes back to not about you. It's all about the customer. It's about that connection, about the communication as well. Did that did that lead you to your book? So now we've got uh, in all of this in all of this incredible growth that you've had. How the heck did you have time to write a book? Incredible. So that is uh, the the book that was published last year, um, Finding Your True North uh, in Retail Sales: How to Find Clarity and Passion in Your Business. How did you How did you sit down and write a book? Was it always inside you? Something you just had to get out there, and or did you dedicate time to it? What What was What was the thinking behind creating the book there? Well, I suppose, Wald, I just it, it's only an ebook, first of all, so it's not huge, but it's it's something that's very downloadable. Mm -hmm. And there are some great little pointers in that and great little tips. Um, but I am also developing an app, which I'm going to be launching quite soon. So I'll let you know when that's coming out. Yeah, and that see. has a six week course on it. Mm. So that is fantastic for for sales teams and for leaders. And there's a lot of videos, a lot of quizzes, a lot of pointers. There's an awful lot of, of um, information in that. So that will be launching quite soon, too. Um, yes, it's all very time consuming, but you do get better the more you do it, the more. And I have got help now as well. Did you, so did you, did you I, just know that you had to do it, Jane? Was it 
had it been had it been in the back of your mind for forever while you were having a cup of tea in the morning thinking gee i just need to sit yeah. down and start writing yes and and i possibly will write a better book about really how to get down and dirty with cells mm. how to really because a lot of the girls that i'm coming in contact with now they're younger than me and they're saying so how how do i get that sail over the line how am i going to do this how am i going to so it's just about having the confidence and knowing that you can bring your customer on that journey. But a lot of people don't ask for the sale. Mm -hmm. There's ways to ask for the sale as well. So when you get so far, they have this kind of pause then. And then people say, do you know what? I'll think about it. When people think about it, they generally don't buy. Truth. Very few will come back and buy from you because you're not really sure yourself. Mm -hmm. They haven't really sold it to you. So don't let them. Don't let them say that to you. I was going to so say, get, 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 a, get that out of the, the, the horizon. Like, get make sure out. that you absolutely don't give them anything left. Absolutely. I mean, use language like they already have it. Yeah. You know, that it's already sold, that it's in their home, that it's on them, whether it's jewelry or whatever it is. So, as I say to them, just visualize this. Mm. I can see your room. This is in that corner. Uh, the function is this, that and the other. And can you imagine when the other the kids come in from from school or when your mom comes to visit? That's a great chair for her to get in and out. of. So you're, you're really painting the picture for people. And then you have to ask for the sale. So where are we at? Will we will we go with this and go with this? And, and you'll say, listen, we'll have it all. Thanks very much. But you've got to you've got to ask for that sale. You've got to sell yourself, sell that confidence and not. You know, a lot of girls are very creative and it's not just girls, of course, guys too. Very creative, very go ahead. But there's a little, a little pause. And in that moment's hesitation, you lose it. Yeah. So it's to keep that momentum going, keep the, keep just, just keep on keeping on with the sale. <laughs> keep communicating, um, keep connecting. Keep communicating, keep connecting. And I see that I can, I'm listening in and I'm tuning in and I'm thinking they lost it actually five minutes ago and now they're struggling. So it's it's those skills to know when to to actually say, here we are. And and if you are having objections, I would I, I would actually try and 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 foresee the objection that may occur yeah. and sort it out as you're going. Part of the Don't process. Let Yes, mm. indeed. Don't let them halt the sale with an objection at the end. So try and, and read them as you're going. Or just say, are you, you're not loving that really, are you? Because here's another option that we could look at as well. So read them as you're going. Just again, don't I, keep on a... Understanding them, like being being able to connect with somebody and, and as you said, reading them, understanding their body language, creating all that. I think from, uh, again, looking back at my own sales history, um, Jane, there was a, a mentor for me that that asked me to take sales seriously. And he gave me a set of tapes, which was, uh, uh, geez, sh again, showing my abs. Tapes are things with little dials in it that used to have a tape deck in your car. Um, but it was a set of tapes that he gave me, and it was by um, Jim Rowan um, called Take Charge of Your Own Life. And that led me on an incredible journey of, of, of self-discovery. Is it something for you, do you have a do you have a list? I mean, as we talk about these soft skills, these people skills, this body language, this connection, this listening, this understanding as being the core element of sales, do you have like a reading list that you recommend to people? Do you say, before we get started, here's your study your study guide. Do you have a set of uh, uh, guidebooks that you've, um, I guess, yeah, developed I mean, as I, you've gone? To be honest, I, I keep reading. I keep looking. I keep learning. You can never stop. Mm. Um, do I have any specifics? Not not necessarily, because there are so many out there. Zig Ziegler is brilliant, too, mm. with sales. Um, but I think it depends on, on the company. It depends on the actual issues that have arisen. But certainly on this new app now, I have got a whole library of books that I really recommend almost. because it will really help them. But I think... The soft skills are so important and more so in this day and age between mental health. We've just come out of COVID and lockdowns. And I think even customers are a little bit more fragile. I think yeah. people have there's a lot more frustration out there. Yeah. And I think you have to be more gentle 
a little bit calmer and just let people take it at their own pace. But I do think reading your body, reading someone's body language and listening, as I was saying, listen to hear, not just listen to. You got to really listen to hear what they're saying. So that you because can connect. people, otherwise you, you you're never gonna you're never going to be able to make that transaction happen unless you've built the the trust and the communication and connection along the way. That's right, and they will tell you so much if you listen to them. Mm, so it'll it'll eliminate a lot of, and that's where a lot of the trust is built because you can mirror back to them and say. Just let me see, did I hear you correctly? You want X or Y, is that correct? Or you're not too keen on such and such. So we're not gonna go down that road. We're gonna take that path. Do you feel comfortable with that? It's about the language that you use and that you feel, God, she's really getting me here. Amazing. So that will lead on and that will build the rapport with them. Amazing, amazing. Well, guys, as we as we hear, there's a there's a path to take for for anybody that's looking to get ahead in sales. And what an amazing career that you can open the doors with there as well, Jane. I think as we as we look around, um, certainly here in Australia, there's there's never a shortage of opportunities in the retail space. There always seems to be uh, positions available and hiring. It's it's actually an incredible path that somebody can get started in with a relatively um, shallow resume, as in they, they, they maybe just be a nice person. And that alone can get you into the door that can uh, lead to international uh, travel, that can create amazing opportunities and an, and an incredible career along the way. So there's a path to walk. And, and guys, if you're, if you're struggling with sales, if you're in a business environment, um, tapping into some of the resources like, like Jane uh, has recommended there and, and the app coming out, this is something that is a learnable skill. So as we as we, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as startup founders, as we look at all of the different skills that are available and are required for us to succeed out there in business, sales and the connection with people is absolutely the the uh, dominant um, number one thing that you're that you should be focused on to be able to grow anything, and that's growing teams, as James was talking about before, having that empathy and understanding with your team and creating that culture, and of course that same connection with customers as well. Jane, thank you so much for the opportunity to to come and and hear from your perspective, how things have, have come across. I love uh, everything that you're getting out there. Um, I'm also, I, I love the fact that now, you know, in that second part of your career, you've created another uh, company, the the, uh, the Jane Hernan coaching.com, where you, you've now taking people under your wing and helping them create that next era. I think that's amazing. So thank you for that. And uh, really, it's just a pleasure. What do we see next for you? Um, your, your, your next six to 12 months, I'm sure is, is going to be an active one. What do you see on the yes. horizon for yourself? So some people have challenged me actually to write a book on some of my posts that I have been posting. And I've really ramped up my posting, as you can see, on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm just loving that. And the connection that that LinkedIn family has been fantastic for me and to me. Um, so I just want to give people as great value as I possibly can because even if it's a Monday morning and someone is stuck and they have they're going into a little sales meeting, just pop in on one of my posts or go back over and have a look and see because there's a lot of value in there. Um, the other thing I'm developing, as I was saying to you, is an app with courses on it. So Fantastic. very short courses to longer courses. And then of course you can always connect with me if you want a one on one. Lovely. So Amazing. I will possibly have a book, but it'll take maybe another 18 months or so. But the app is in the pipeline for the next couple of months. Amazing. We look forward to, so, it, to it coming up. Well, thank, thank you, guys. And and Jane, I appreciate your time and energy there. And and everyone, again, um, talking about being a consistent learner, looking at, at uh, Jane's education there, her last uh, qualification was just you know, 12, 18 months ago, still pushing that uh, that boundary of continuous learning and and creating those skills. So tap in and, and see how far you can take yourself. Jane, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you and what you've achieved. And uh, thank you for making that available to people uh, and helping that next generation of salespeople coming forward and, and achieving great things as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Jane Hernan. Thank you. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing what's, what's coming next for you. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Walt. Thank you.